Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Peace Building Cluster at the Innovations in International Philanthropy in Symposium. Um, I'm Melanie Greenberg, and I lead the Peace Building Program at Humanity United, based in Washington, D.C. and San Francisco. And it is such a great pleasure to be talking to my wonderful friend and colleague, Maria Victoria Llorente, who is the Executive Director of Fundación Ideas para la Paz, based in Bogota, Colombia. Welcome, Maria Victoria. I wonder if you'd like to introduce yourself. Of course. Thank you. Thank you, Melanie. I'm very happy to be here with you. And uh, yes, I, I have been the, the executive director of uh, Ideas for Peace Foundation in, uh, in Bogota, Colombia, which is uh, mainly a, a think and do tank uh, that works in peace and security. And uh, we have been working for the past 20 years on these issues in Colombia. And uh, and I am a political scientist and I've been working on peace and security issues like for 30 years. So uh, so OK, here I am and uh, I'm very grateful to be invited to this conversation with you, Melanie. Oh, thank you, Maria Victoria. And I'm so happy to have the chance today to talk about peace building in Colombia and your vision for the future of peace and to talk also with this audience of philanthropists about um, our own relationship and how that's developed and the way that I hope uh, that we all feel we're working together to build peace. So thank you. We thought it might be helpful just to have a little bit of an introduction to what is peace building. So I think if you have 100 people in a room, there'll be 120 definitions of peace building. So perhaps just to have some common ground for the audience today of, of what we mean when we talk about peace building. So peace building is a relatively new field that when I graduated from law school 30 years ago, we didn't even have a field called peace building. It was mediation or conflict resolution or development or human rights. But as a field, it's really something that's emerged in the last 30 years. And just as a brief definition, peace building is all of the processes and structures that a community, a nation, or areas of the world need to be able to resolve conflict through negotiation and through dialogue rather than through deadly violence. And it can be um, at a huge number of levels. It can happen in your home, in your community, in your city, within a community, within a country, internationally across borders. And the field encompasses ideas of justice, education, health, democracy, development. They all come together around uh, creating what we call positive peace. So negative peace is just the absence of violence, but positive peace are all of the structures that societies need, again, to be able to resolve difference and resolve conflict that will always be with us, but through nonviolent means. So with, with that understanding, I wonder if we could talk with Victoria a little bit about where Colombia is now. We're five years into the peace process. And if you could just talk about what you're observing from your vantage point at peak. Yes, Melanie. So, so yes, as you say, we are, a, we are going to celebrate at the end of this year, five years uh, of uh, of the signing of the peace agreement with uh, with the FARC, which led to the disarmament and uh, the mobilization of of the FARC, uh, and I must say, is one of, it was one of the oldest uh, guerrillas uh, in the world, uh, which had been uh, in insurgent struggle in Colombia like for five decades. So that was really huge for Colombia and this process for many people in Colombia and for us particularly this process and the resulting peace agreement uh, opened like a huge uh, window of opportunity precisely to build a solid peace in Colombia uh, in, in the sense that the peace agreement, uh, 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 this was like the first peace agreement in Colombia that addressed uh, uh, directly structural problems 
such as a comprehensive rural reform or citizens' participation and, uh, and um, the quality of our democracy, uh, the problem, uh, the drug problems, illicit crops and uh, illegal economies uh, in Colombia. Um, so it was like a huge opportunity to address these, uh, these issues. Uh, and uh, and it also re generated a transitional justice model which is unique internationally well known and unique uh, in the sense that it saw it, it really sought to balance uh, victims uh, rights to uh, to truth to justice and uh, reparations and guarantees of uh, of no repetition with uh, the possibility that the FARC could transform itself into a political actor within our legal institutional uh, framework so so this piece are but but you know but the problem is that this peace agreement was not a result of a national consensus uh, but rather fueled political uh, polarization and we lost by a tiny margin the plebiscite that was held in 2016, and later the candidate of the main uh, opposing uh, opposing party, political party, won the presidential uh, elections. So this has been like the context, and I think that is very important to understand the context within which the peace accord has been um, implemented. This has been a transition marked by political struggles progress in the implementation of aspects of this agreement that have been prior prioritized by the government, uh, but not under the notion of the integral implementation of the agreement that was like really uh, the core of this of this uh, agreement was the concept of integral implementation. And also like a very, very worrying trend in the past few years towards the intensification of, uh, of, of violence uh, in areas where the FARC were a strong actor and even a regulator. So in some, this is a transition of great ambiguity and uncertainty where right now, I think that we might be relapsing into conflict and relapsing into conflict is a real possibility right now. So, the, 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 all, the, all the opportunity of building a solid peace that we had five years ago, I think that r right now are really at risk. Well, thank you so much for that, for that overview and a sense of where we are now. And I'm just thinking about COVID and how, you know, how COVID has shown up in Colombia. And do you see the state response to COVID and the way the country has managed that crisis as being related to the drivers of conflict there? Well, the, you know, um, we have, I, I have to say that with the pandemic, that COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, really uh, meshed together with social unrest in Colombia. So we are right now, uh, we have been like for the past three months, uh, having marches and protests, uh, vandalism in uh, in some of them. So real, real social unrest uh, in uh, Colombian streets and uh, in many areas of Colombia uh, that meshed uh, together with uh, with this pandemic in the sense in the sense that uh, 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 the, 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 the the social unrest uh, has to do mainly uh, with many unresolved issues. Uh, in Colombia and the pandemic, uh, what it did is that uh, it really um, uh, enhanced uh, inequality in Colombia and showed uh, all of the really um, gave like a, a greater, you know, setbacks in poverty levels and confronted us with the great inequality that we have uh, in, our, in our country. The COVID-19 pandemic had 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 disproportionate uh, negative in, uh, effects uh, on the most vulnerable, mainly women and youth, youth that are right now like the center of the mobilizations, but uh, that youth that feel that there is no possibilities for them and no future for, for them and uh, whose levels of, uh, of, uh, of unemployment 
have rised in uh, in incredible uh, uh, features and uh, and also it has a dispro disproportionate negative effect uh, in in those uh, remote and conflict affected areas so so that is the problem with the with the pandemic right now and uh, i think that there are many claims right right now but the motor has to do with the accumulation of unresolved issues in our country. It is a, a call to the states to address a situation of discontent and a feeling of no future by various sectors, many of them uh, youth. And there, I think that, you know, there has been uh, not a moment of, uh, of a greater need uh, for a state, a state that works uh, like the one caused by the pandemic. And, uh, and uh, Right now, that's it. we have really a state not only uh, not only fractured because of the political uh, uh, polarization, but also uh, with real real difficulties to reach all the needs of the Colombians, of the poor Colombians, and of the people that have really come back into poverty, and of the people in those uh, faraway areas where conflict is uh, is reviving. It's been so inspiring over the last year and a half to work with you on in such a close way as you are thinking so emergently about what the country needs and how both FIFA and your partners can address all the issues that you see emerging. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the systems approach and the way that FIFA um, approaches complexity and how that then allows you to know exactly what kind of programs can be most effective and how you're accumulating um, these different actions to bring peace to Colombia. Well, you know, it, it, when, when we were in the midst of the, of the peace process, so we began to have like a, like a reflection in, 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 at FIP. So we were very optimistic at that moment. Yeah, I was, I'm talking about 2014, 2015. We were very optimistic about the possibilities uh, of peace in Colombia, but we were really thinking that the possibilities of peace in Colombia had to do uh, with uh, the way in which we were going to implement uh, the peace agreement the way uh, so if we could if we could comply with that uh, agreement or not uh, so uh, because we had had uh, various experiences prior to this peace process with the FARC of uh, the mobilization disarmament of the mobilization of huge uh, uh, illegal armies you know uh, the paramilitaries uh, the paramilitary groups uh, uh, demobilized in the early 2000. So, uh, so we already had like this experience of having uh, peace agreements and having the demobilization of of, uh, of armies of illegal armies and uh, and then uh, relapsing into violence. So uh, and not being able of uh, building a peace in a in a solid way in Colombia. So we were really reflecting on how could we uh, uh, untangle that and, uh, and really understand why uh, if we had had all these experiences, uh, we haven't been able to build a, a sustainable peace in Colombia. So we really thought that the, and, and we came by uh, with this book of Rob Rizigliani <laughs> about, uh, about how to make peace last and about the system, uh, the system approach, the systemic approach to peace building. And uh, for, for us, it was really, you know, a, a completely different way to approach the, the problem, to understand that this is not something that, you know, we do like linear actions or uh, it is something that we have where we have to understand that we are working within a complex system and that everything is interconnected. So how we can uh, understand and view all these connections and these patterns and, and, and where we are, uh, uh, you know, where FIP is uh, uh, in the system, and uh, and which which is our leverage? Our we, we're you know we're an NGO, and uh, and our capacity is limited. So 
where can we really put all of our capacity uh, to work and uh, and to try to bring some change uh, that that could uh, help uh, build more sustainable peace in Colombia. So that is why we approach this. We we, we really uh, uh, took this uh, this approach as as something new, and we have and we have now you know evolved a lot. Uh, with the help of uh, Humanity United, we have uh, we have really uh, evolved uh, a lot in the use of this approach uh, in in different ways. Uh, not only trying to understand the problem and to find leverage, but also uh, in trying to uh, to do different conversations, bring different parties to different conversations uh, uh, with. Uh, uh, the systems uh, uh, tools, the system map mapping uh, tools, and uh, and all that 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 has really been like a, like a very 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 different way and a very exciting way for us uh, to 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 approach uh, our job in peace building and to see and to see you know where can we make. A tiny difference, at least, <laughs> but a difference. Yes. It's been so amazing just from the outside to observe how you've taken your view of this very complex system and you use the meta map, the map that you created very literally of the conflict. And I've seen people who have different views of the conflict come together around your map and even physically to start looking at the problem together. There's something yeah. so powerful, I think, about being able to zoom out and to see all of these different ways that the um, issues come together and to put everyone on then on the same page to unravel the issues of the system. So I think these tools are very powerful. Yes, I think, you know, what we have found is that we are not a, with with our meta map about uh, a, a, the obstacles uh, for peace building in Colombia. This is not a meta map where we are we are saying, uh, you know, like a definite story about peace building in Colombia. So we're just showing uh, the factors and how they are related. But there is no casual causal relationship with uh, with uh, uh, on those factors. So so we are not really, you know, uh, engaged in uh, in trying to push forward a specific view. Uh, we understand that the, that the systemic approach gives us, you know, the tools to have a conversation and to bring in different parties uh, to build a common a, a, a common knowledge about what is happening. And, uh, and this is not a talk uh, among experts because many of the people we've been We've been talking our different people, business people, uh, different different people. Uh, we bring together to this conversation, and uh, and and I think that this is a very 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 powerful tool to really uh, build a, a a common understanding of what is happening, um, and it really helps. It really helps. Yes. I wonder if we could spend just a couple of minutes talking about. How can the international philanthropic community help FEEP and organizations like FEEP build more comprehensive peace? Um, and maybe talking a little bit about how Humanity United and FEEP work together, but also um, the different ways that be most effective for international philanthropy to engage in Colombia in such a complex landscape. Yes. Well, I think that that I think that the name of the game is flexibility, <laughs> because uh, because uh, you know building uh, you know contributing to build peace is something that is uncertain. You mm -hmm. don't really have a roadmap. This is not something that you do A plus B equals C. No, <laughs> no, because you are in a political context. There is nothing more political than building peace. So, so you are in a political context. So you are always engaging with different parties and with different situations, emerging situations, uh, where you have to adapt and to find and to be really innovative. So, uh, so I think that this is. Uh, so I say that flexibility is the name of the game because uh, how can you have? Uh, flexible funding 
to really do whatever is needed to do at the moment that is needed to do. Because if you have a, you face a problem uh, or you face an issue in a particular moment, and uh, and uh, if you have to, you know, write a project, uh, give it <laughs> to the founder and do all the paperwork that will take like at least six months. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you come back to the problem, you have an, a completely different issue uh, to address. So so I think that that to have like this flexibility and to have like this uh, a permanent conversation that, that I think that is something that we have built with humanity and it has been a very particular feature of the way humanity united is working in peace building right now and it has been working with us that is like how we have like this continuous conversation back and forth and we are learning from what we are doing and uh, and uh, and help us connect with other agendas so uh, so really uh, really in a very constructive way uh, and give us like the opportunity uh, to really address the problems in the way we feel that we can address them when in the moment that we have to address them, not six months later, but in the moment where we have to address them. So I, I must say, uh, lastly, that, you know, uh, Melanie, uh, uh, in Colombia, we have had a lot of cooperation, international cooperation, uh, and we are very grateful uh, to the international community because there has been, you know, uh, a, a lot of uh, interest in the international community on the peace process in Colombia. And in previous years before the peace process, I think that we have had at least 20 years of the international community, more than 20 years, the international community re really being very interested in what is happening in Colombia and in helping the Colombians. And we're very grateful as Colombians uh, for that. But, but the problem is that we, uh, organizations as mine, depend a lot on the international cooperation. And these, uh, and these, uh, um, this sort of funding is uh, is very uh, has a lot of constraints mm -hmm. and uh, it sometimes you know i was talking to you previously that it it feels like i feel like a contortionist you know that i'm i'm trying to fit my agenda into a uh, into the the agenda of another country and uh, uh, different uh, with different interests. So how can so it's sometimes it's very difficult to really move forward and have sort of a cumulative way of building your your uh, your uh, your what you're doing and your work uh, on peace building, which is mainly cumulative because we're not going to have this is not something that you're going to change from one day to another. This is something uh, that you have to build by bit by bit, <laughs> little by little. And uh, and how do you learn from what you did? So, you know, uh, international cooperation, very helpful, but doesn't give us the room we need uh, uh, to really learn of what we uh, of our experiences and to really build on that. I think that uh, that philanthropy uh, on the other on the other side can really a, a fill that void and help us have like a more a, a, a more a, a, an agenda that can build on itself and uh, and uh, that help us learn from our experiences and uh, and really be like like more uh, flexible in that way. And this well, has been our experience with Humanity United, I must say. Well, thank Very you. We huh? tremendously appreciate the level of honesty in the relationship and being able to hear when you feel things are going well, but they're not going well, how you need to pivot to respond to this really rapidly changing landscape. Yeah. And we are also really trying as a philanthropy to think about how do we work beyond a two year time frame? Because peace doesn't happen in two year increments. How do we have really flexible general operating support so that you are able to make decisions about how you want to spend funds? And it's really been a journey for us as a philanthropy to think about how, how can we help you and our other grantees realize your own power? Um, and we're really there in a mode of accompaniment and not trying to dictate the terms. Yes. But it's no, I think that 
too. Well, you know, Melanie, I think that, that for us, you know, we, we have been uh, uh, having international funding and philanthropy funding like for many, many years, Incl uh, also national philanthropy uh, uh, funding, funding from uh, businesses and, uh, and from families here in Colombia. Uh, but but I think that there is always like these sort of constraints that doesn't. So I, I think that that transparency and uh, and um, and yes, I, I I believe that the word is transparency. The way that we can really share. You know, I don't think this is really working. I think that we have to change. That we really really need to go uh, in this other in this in a different context. I would say as an organization that is receiving funding, I would say, no, we're doing fabulous. We had all these uh, and we try to show uh, to show off all of that, all, all of our results, even though we are aware that they are not really uh, completely what we were expecting. And uh, uh, so I think that that a more transparent relation a relationship can really can really be helpful. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. I think that maybe uh, and maybe this is a question for you, Melanie, <laughs> uh, uh, that probably probably that that is not something that you can work with the, all the organizations. Maybe there are specific organizations where you can build this sort of relationship um, and of exchange horizontal exchange not all the organ not maybe not all the, the organizations can be uh, can be as uh, as uh, you know as responsive as you as you will as as you will hope in this uh, in this model i don't know uh, what has been your experience on that well i think that there is very much a trend towards what's called trust based philanthropy which is very much what we're talking about, of how do you develop these trusting relationships where it's really you are able to decide how you most want to spend funds, the direction of the work, and that it's much more of a, an accompaniment and a partnership rather than the philanthropy putting together a particular model. So I think there's promise there. But Maria, the I, I, we're at the end of our 20 minutes. I feel like it is completely yeah. flown by. OK, I wanted to talk more, but I think that we have to end here. <laughs> OK, well, we other many, many opportunities, and I just want to take a moment to tell you how grateful I am for everything that you and FEEP are doing in Colombia and just how deeply I cherish our friendship and our funding relationship and look forward to great work ahead. And thank you. Well, great, Melanie. We feel the same here in, in, uh, at FEEP. You know that. So it has been it has been a very a very fruitful relationship for us. Thank you.